service. I uh, got myself a little out of order and forgot to turn my microphone on and reminds me of um, someone else. <laughs> Sometimes it does that, but uh, it's, uh, that's all right. But uh, now this time, today it's me. So uh, anyway, let's go ahead and take out your Bibles if you'd like. We're going to start with our scripture memory. Psalm 119, as we've been working our way through it, um, we're reviewing verses 67 and 68. And then we get to go um, into a couple other verses that are just going to be fun ones to memorize. And uh, if you've already been working on that in Sunday school um, and reviewing that or seeing it, um, it's, an, it's a different one, but it's, uh, we, get to, we get to have fun with that, all right? Well, let's go ahead and start by reviewing our ones from this past week. Ready? Psalm 119, 67 and 68. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good, and dost good. Teach me thy statutes. God is always good, and he always does what is good. And uh, we ought to be looking to him to teach us those statutes. Well, the next two verses um, say, The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. You wouldn't think that that verse might be in the Bible, but there it is. And uh, so um, I, probably not one that we're all signing uh, underneath our names as we want to uh, have our life verse for someone. But, uh, um, but at any rate, the delighting in thy law, their heart is as fat as grease. I'm not sure how fat Greece is exactly. Um, I didn't do any, uh, any Bible study or scientific studies on that. Uh, all we, uh, I know is that um, uh, the idea is that they have as much as their heart wants. They have everything that they would like to have in this life, but I delight in thy law. It's a matter of priorities and what we go to for satisfaction. And um, over and again in the Bible, we find that uh, talking about the, they, they, are, they have fatness and that kind of thing, it shows that they have all that they want, all that they can have, uh, all that they uh, would like to go after. They, they, they please their eyes, they please their flesh. And as we all understand, those are um, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those are the things of the world and not of the Father, as First John reminds us. So let's go ahead and... Um, and enjoy reviewing these verses together, right? Psalm 119, 69 and 70. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. Psalm 119, 69 and 70. Amen. Well, I hope that you are committed to hiding God's word in your heart that you might not sin against him. And uh, remember the motivation for memorizing scripture uh, directly ties with our desire to be uh, holy and to be righteous and uh, pure in this life. And the way that we do that is by hiding God's word in our heart. So then here's the, here's the convicted, convicting part. If I'm not spending time memorizing God's word, what am I really saying? That it's not that high a priority, that it's not really that important, uh, how pure and holy and righteous I live. Uh, it, it really is a big deal. And uh, I'm the first one to admit the older you get, the harder it is to memorize. But just because it's harder doesn't mean it's not still right and uh, we should still be working on it. And the beautiful thing is, as you get older, you can memorize the same verses over and over again because you just keep forgetting them. And, um, and that's part of it too. But I think the process, uh, uh, Pastor Weigel's dad, Jack Weigel, uh, said to me one day, and I've never forgotten it, he said, it's the process that God uses of meditating on God's word in the process of memorizing that brings the benefit. And so uh, just because you can't, uh, you can't memorize as many verses or sit down and quote as many verses right back as you once could as a kid, uh, doesn't mean that the process isn't still validated and important. And so I, I hope that you're committed to that. Let me give you a couple of announcements. Number one, Tuesday is our uh, first uh, faith family breakfast of the month. And um, it's uh, the 
Uh, first Tuesday is always our time to eat breakfast together. Uh, this, uh, this month, it's right here at Roseanne's. And, um, and so if you haven't signed up, please do sign up. It's a great opportunity to just fellowship, uh, build relationships with our community restaurants, and uh, to encourage one another. And so if you're available at 9 o'clock on Tuesday, that's a great thing to do. And then tonight, right after the evening service, right as we get done, um, we, are, we are going to uh, welcome some people into membership, but we have some painting work that's still in the final stages. Some of the conduit that the electricians had to put up right at the end still needs to be uh, painted. And Gary is our painter, and uh, he said, Pastor, if you forget, I'm going to go over here and do jumping jacks. And so I may just forget just to be able to see that. I'm just kidding. And, um, but um, uh, otherwise, uh, he's going to have to move these chairs in order to uh, get that done. But many hands make light work, and so we should be able to help him out and uh, move some of these chairs out of the way. We'll do it in an orderly fashion, and it will matter where we stack them. And so uh, instead of just grabbing chairs and, and starting to move them, uh, let's get some instruction exactly where we're putting them. But you can begin to stack up the ones that need that, and we'll uh, knock that out uh, tonight. And uh, t tomorrow they can finish the painting so that everything is perfect uh, for our big day on the 12th. And uh, we're very excited about it. One of the features that we're featuring next week on our Dedication Sunday is out here uh, by the information table is going to be a display of the history of Faith Baptist Church going all the way back to the beginning. And, um, and our founding pastor, uh, one of his family members, Somebody tell me, where is Russ and Linda? How old is, how, 97, and she's planning on being here for the dedication Sunday, and uh, we're going to make that a big deal and introduce her to you, give you a chance to meet her, but uh, God bless the vision uh, of that family, and look at what it is today. If you want to uh, see a little a uh, bit and understand better the entire history of our church. How did we get here? Uh, it'll be a neat thing for you to be able to take a tour through, and uh, we're very much looking forward uh, to that. Let me just say as well, thank you for uh, handing out a lot of information. I know many of you uh, have been handing it out in your communities. Uh, we did hit uh, the doors uh, in the two mile or two square mile radius around here that we wanted to do. And we even had some people visiting this morning from those visits. And, uh, and so we rejoice in that and uh, we're watching God bear fruit. And uh, that fruit is remaining and bringing forth more fruit. What a joy uh, to be able to be a part of that. Tonight we have Dr. Daryl uh, Franzel with us. And uh, Brother Franzel and I have been friends for a long time. It goes all the way back to my days at Loomis Park Baptist Church as a youth pastor. One of my teenage girls uh, went to his school, uh, even though he was quite a ways north, uh, just on the outskirts of Lansing, and we were in Jackson. Uh, she went to school. She lived halfway between and went to school up there, and so I got to meet him all those many years ago, did not really get to know him that well. But then coming back to Michigan, we reacquainted. We have a lot of interest as far as making a difference in Lansing and the political spectrum. And so we have uh, been able to keep uh, close tabs on each other and be good friends, prayer partners with each other. I thank the Lord for him. Uh, after 24 years uh, as being pastor of Capital City Baptist Church, uh, he retired and uh, actually just retreaded. And, um, and has uh, become uh, the front spokesperson for Alabama Baptist Seminary, and he'll talk a little bit more about that, and uh, has a tremendous ministry uh, as an artist, and he'll talk a little bit about that. You've seen some of his artwork out here and, and the opportunity to share the gospel, he even uses that in a church growth uh, pattern, and he'll say a lot more about that, but we're in for a real treat tonight. And then following uh, his message, we will uh, take time to uh, spend some time around the Lord's Supper and uh, remember the Lord's death uh, till he come for us. It's such a critical, important part of our spiritual development, an important part as an ordinance of the local church, and we want to make sure that we give that 
proper time tonight. All right, I think that's all of the announcements that I have. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you uh, for the opportunity that you've given to us to be in church tonight. We have a myriad of people who are out and, and traveling. We thank you for them. We ask your blessings upon them. Keep them safe. Bring them back to us healthy and refreshed, we pray. We ask, God, that you would meet with us in a special way tonight as we look at some foundational truths that uh, uh, allow us as Christians to magnify your name. I pray that you would uh, do a work in our hearts and draw us very close to yourself. We thank you for all of the answers to prayer we've watched you do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And we give you glory for it and we thank you for it. I pray that you'd meet with us in a special way tonight. And we thank you for this opportunity for we do pray in Jesus name, amen. Well, let's start with a time of singing with number 421. The song is Higher Ground. My prayer, my aim is higher ground, it says. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll sing 421. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world. Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught a joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. On higher ground. While you're still standing, flip over to 414. The song is called All I Need. And as we're talking about having our satisfaction only in Jesus Christ, we'll sing just the first three verses of 414. He is all I need. Jesus Christ is made to me all I need, all I need. He all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore, my redemption full and sure, He is all I need. Jesus is my all in all, all I need, all I need, while He I cannot fall, He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore, my redemption full and sure, He is all I need. He's the treasure of my soul, all I need, all cleansed and made me whole. He is 
is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness forevermore. My redemption, pure and sure, he is all I need. Flip over to 433 as you're being seated. We'll sing this last one, just a couple of verses more more about Jesus. 433. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace who others show, more of his saving fullness he, more of his love who died for me, more, more about Jesus. Jesus, let me learn more of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saints. Amen. Good singing. Our ushers are coming to receive our evening tithes and love offerings. Faith promise giving, opportunity to contribute to the next generation through our daycare pre preschool and Christian school and uh, opportunity to participate in the building that God has given to us and uh, great opportunities that lie ahead. And we were talking this afternoon with some families and uh, they went to a church one time uh, that as soon as they announced that it was the time for the offering, everybody started clapping as a testimony of the excitement and cheerfulness in giving. And I thought to myself, not that I'm advocating we should do that, but I think that our heart should be just like that. This is an opportunity. It should be uh, something that we're anticipating, something that we're excited about, because the reason we can give is because God has given to us. And we're excited about participating in this program. Phil, would you pray? Ask God's blessing on the offering.
Thank you, Sharon. Beautifully played. Well, you know, there's something to admire about those who have been steady and consistent and faithful in the ministry. And Dr. Franzo has been that example to young preachers like myself, and now is in the ministry of training the next generation to fill our pulpits, to take that stand, to make a difference for the cause of Christ. Dr. Franzo, why don't you come, share with us your burden, and then preach to us from God's word. Thank you, Pastor. It is a privilege to be with you here tonight. As your pastor has said, we've been friends a long time, and every Sunday morning, I hear from three people faithfully. The first is God, the second is my wife, and the third is your pastor. Amen. And I get a little text that says, I've prayed for you today in a, in a memory verse of some sort, and I want to tell you something. Uh, it's good to hear God still speaking to you. It's also good to know your wife's still speaking to you. <laughs> but it's just as important to have a friend tell you that he's praying for you every Sunday morning before you enter into the pulpit. I pastored for 40 years in Michigan and uh, pastored in Cadillac and then in Pinconning and then in Lansing. I just keep moving south. and. Uh, when we were about ready to uh, retire, and I really felt it was time for a younger man to come on the scene there at Capital City Baptist, and about two years ago, I had a heart attack. I think that was that grease in the heart uh, that did it. <laughs> and uh, recovered from that. The Lord really has saved my life several times over the years, and, and, uh, and each time it just reassures me he's not done with me yet. And I didn't feel old enough to just quit, so I said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And uh, lo and behold, uh, I received a contact from uh, Dr. Ira Walton in Laverne, Alabama, and he was representing the Brothers of Cyrene, which is a, a, a group of conservative black preachers, mainly in the South, but they have some preachers up North too. And they asked me if I would come and head up their seminary. And I said, well, tell me more about it. And they said, do you understand the plight of black America? And I said, uh, well, I, I guess it's like every other part of America. There's a real problem. We're becoming a mission field instead of a mission sending country. And they said, well, you don't understand how bad it is. Uh, what we're facing is that 99 percent of black churches in America are teaching a works-based salvation, even in the Baptist churches. Uh, traditionalism in the black community is, is destroying them. And I said, well, I, I was not aware of that. I really wasn't. I said, I'm brokenhearted. You know, we, we've sent missionaries all over the world, and, and we realize the importance of, of reaching all people groups and uh, he began to pour his heart out to me. And the more my wife and I listened to he and his wife, and, and he told me some of the history. He said that Dr. Martin Luther King had applied for enrollment at Tennessee Temple, and they turned him down because he was black. Jesse Jackson had applied for enrollment at Bob Jones University, and they turned him down because he was black. The philosophy in a lot of black uh, colleges and, and even some of the churches of that day was equal but separate. Can you imagine what would have happened if Dr. Martin Luther King would have enrolled successfully and graduated from Tennessee Temple? The difference it would have made to black America. And he said, now, what we, we don't want just a all-black school. He said that would be just as bad as having an all-white school. He said, we want a school that really represents all of what God has created, and that's the human race, not various different colors race. And I thought about that. You know, the Lord had been touching my heart over the years and really kind of preparing me for that meeting. Uh, I had led uh, 21 mission trips around the world and had a chance to be in, in missionary planted churches literally all over, and, and one of the things that, that always, you know, kind of surprised me was that 
you would go into these churches and you would hear them sing the same songs that we sang music-wise. It was just in their language. You could sing right along with them. One day I was asked to uh, speak in an Arabic church that was headed up by Dr. Winston Mazakis. And as my wife and I was sitting there and listening to the singing, it was all Arabic in style. And uh, I asked him, I said, Dr. Mazakis, I said, what, what is the music? And he said, well, they're Christian songs like anybody else would sing, but we sing them our way. He said, because it's more acceptable culturally to our, our people. And that began causing me to think. And then when, when Dr. Walton had talked to me and the Brothers of Cyrene about uh, the cultural differences in our country, I really understood that. In the military, for, I was in the military for about eight years, served in the Republic of Vietnam. And, and when I came back to the States, one of the duty assignments I had was working in the race relations office at Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah, Georgia. And I begin to realize that really all cultural groups have the same needs, have the same desires, have the same sins, have the same family feelings and, and everything else. We really are truly all the human race. He said, what we want to do is have a school that does not look at anybody by their color or background, but teaches a solid, sound doctrine of the Bible and prepares them to go out and reach every creature. And I said, well, that's not a new message. <laughs> it maybe has not been done properly, but, but it's not a new message. And so after a prayer, uh, my wife and I uh, agreed to go down to Alabama. And so we've been there a year now. And the first year, uh, we started the campus program. They had an extension program going, and first year we had about 20 students, and that was right in the midst of the pandemic and everything. We were excited about that, even though it was a small number, it was a start. And uh, our youngest uh, student is uh, 17, our oldest is 73. And we have a, a mixed group. Matter of fact, if you'll put that first presentation up, uh, Alabama Baptist Seminary, the fellow in the upper left-hand corner is Dr. Ira Walton. He was a young man who was born in the projects of Birmingham, Alabama, rejected by his father, heading to a typical situation with young youth in the projects of Birmingham, Alabama. And the Lord put him in the Marine Corps. Uh, while he was in the Marine Corps, he and his wife, uh, while serving in Okinawa, were led to the Lord by a missionary pastor. And when he came back to the States and attended a, a fundamental conservative Baptist church, the Lord called him to the ministry. He said, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want except Alabama. <laughs> well, now we, we know that you don't tell the Lord where you don't want to go. And so he ended up in Laverne, Alabama, and uh, 21 years ago started a church down there. And uh, the Brothers of Cyrene has been around for about 15 years or so. Uh, they have a youth camp and uh, a local church, Christian school, daycare, and all these ministries there on the campus. And what they're trying to do, and they have asked me to be in, involved in, I have caught the vision, believe me, is to change the culture of America back to what it was meant to be. Uh, one nation under who? God. One nation under God. There's really only two nations that were ever established under God in the history of mankind. The first nation was the children of Israel. And the second nation was the United States of America. Now, we had a president not too long ago that said that we were no longer a Christian nation. And I would disagree with him. We are a Christian nation with a whole lot of heathen in it. And it's our job to try to convert the heathen. Amen. Any of us who have done any Bible study at, at a college level realize that in hermeneutics, and that's a $25 word for the rules to interpretation of the Word of God, understand that really there's only three ethnicities that God recognizes. And the whole Bible is written to one or more of those three ethnicities. The first ethnicity is the Gentiles and trace their roots back to the first Adam. The second ethnicity 
is the Jewish nation. They uh, trace their roots back to Abraham. And the third ethnicity is the church, the bride of Christ. And we trace our roots back to Jesus Christ himself, amen. Three ethnicities, only three. You'll notice in there that none of it had anything to do with color. None of it had anything to do with nationality because we're all part of the human race. We're all created by God. We are all created to be moral, spiritual beings worshiping an almighty, all-living God. And somehow we've kind of lost that along the way. And so we find then that uh, the seven points that Alabama talks about is ethnicity, first of all, three separate ethnicities under God. The next one is culture. There are multiple cultures. Man has made up all those cultures. And it's all right to be different. Matter of fact, Jesus uh, knows that we are a peculiar people. We're called a peculiar people. Some of us a little bit more peculiar perhaps than others. We are unique in ourselves. And then the third one is truism. There is only one truism. There's only one God. Paul said it best when he said, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. I've had people ask me, well, if that's the case, how come there's so many different churches? And I said, well, denominationalism didn't start until 300 and some. And uh, everything prior to that was one church movement with one set of beliefs. Now, there were some Judaizers, you all know that, as uh, Paul went around, he faced those that kept putting or trying to put works back into salvation. But you and I understand that salvation is not of works lest anyone should boast. It's by our faith in God's grace and mercy. And so there's only one truism. That's what we need to teach in our colleges. And uh, the next one <clears throat> is security. It's a matter of the mind. Again, that's made up by man. Our security really is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Last couple of years, we've faced a lot of things, not only here in the States, but uh, around the world, especially with the pandemic and all the things that has come about as a result of that. And various people have faced it in various ways. And I'm here to tell you that regardless what you feel about it, that uh, that is one of the things that came as a result of sin. Do you realize in the garden before sin, there were no viruses, there were no Fauci's, Matter of fact, the closest thing to that got him in trouble and it was called the munchies. <laughs> we find then that this is an all-out attack and the thing that it has attacked more than anything else is the church of Jesus Christ. Nothing has ever shut down the church before. And there are some churches sad to say will never open their doors again. It excites me to see the crowd that is here tonight on Labor Day weekend. I commend you. But we need to stand strong, church. We are invincible. Because no one can touch us unless God says so. We find that the next truism or the next uh, talking point, salvation, one path to God, you know, it's interesting, probably all of us have, have talked to people about Jesus Christ. And I was on a plane one day, and I was talking to a guy, and he said, well, I don't really believe in Christianity, per se, as being the only way. He says, there are many ways to heaven. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's not so. That really just is not true. There's only one way to heaven. Now, you might be told that there is a lot of ways to get one place or another, but there's only one way that will get you there, truly, and that's through Jesus Christ. And we had a chance to talk while we were on the plane. I, I never, I, I can't say that I led him to the Lord, but at least I sowed a seed. Got him to think about that. Next one. Unrest. There are many topics of unrest in the world today, but it all goes back to sin. And that's made up by man, too. And then the next one. Seven, the final one, 
uh, which is a good number, I like seven. Peace, peace with God, peace of God, peace in God, and God gives that to us. The president does that, give that to us. The Supreme Court doesn't give it to us. The, the legislatures do not give that to us. Our employers don't give that to us. A bank account don't give that to us. Only comes from God. Okay, the next slide. Working together. We find here the importance of us working together. And what are we trying to achieve? Well, let's go ahead and run those up. Uh, we're offering a one-year Bible certificate, a two-year associate degree, a three-year graduate degree, four-year bachelor program. We have a master's program in existence right now. We're working on a doctoral program. And hopefully we'll have that up and running in the next year or two. Next slide. <clears throat> Bridging the gap is our model. Matter of fact, I, I have a bridging the gap I want to present to your pastor right now. Uh, I count him a dear friend, and uh, there you are, Pastor. Thank you. Bridging the gap between the lost and the saved through evangelism, bridging the gap in cultures and the various different people's group, brid, uh, and between generations and learning, and that's through teaching, learning and teaching. Next slide. Focus. What are we focusing on? The mission, we have uh, these things in mind, training men and women to reach the world, teaching the truth without compromise or bias, taking hope to black America through godly education, turning hearts and lives from hate to love of God. Can you imagine if we could achieve that in our own country, let alone the rest of the world? Next slide. We have some goals. Strengthening the family through God, strengthening the nation under God, strengthening the church in God, strengthening the cause for God. And then the last goal, or the last uh, slide, go ahead. How can we help? Pray for the work, donate to the work, send men and women to the work, promote the work to others. Alabama Baptist Seminary, please remember us. I want to talk a little bit about, just before we get into the message, thanks, fellas, for the slide, uh, and that's the Gospel Ship Project. Uh, you can, if you'd like, purchase copies of the, of the uh, pictures. They're on the table out there. It really was all designed. Uh, I was sick for about oh, six weeks and out of the pulpit. I'd never been out of the pulpit that long in my whole life, and, and God talked to me the whole time, and it was about the gospel ship. Another fellow and I had gone together on that and we came up with, God really gave this concept to us and it is a church growth campaign. It is all nautically based. Everybody likes ships. Anybody here don't like a ship? Okay. Everybody likes ships. We have a track and I've never had anyone throw those tracks away. They always take it. They like the picture of the ship. It has a story of the ship. And then it has a real simple gospel message in it. Sometimes gospel tracts, if we're not careful, we write them as a Christian to a Christian. Lost people don't understand our, our jargon. And so it's written very simply to someone who is lost about how to get saved. And then uh, it's a three-year campaign. Most church growth campaigns are short-lived. They don't establish habits. This program is a three-year program and establishes habits. And so we've used it in several churches. We're teaching it at the uh, seminary. And uh, if you'd like to get some copies, all that money goes to the program itself. And uh, we have a, a picture we'll be giving to the pastor for the church too, so. Now tonight, I want to encourage you with a message entitled The Rock. We're talking about foundational truths here. So far, the seminary and, and the gospel ship and all these things, the rock, Matthew 16, 18, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, pebble, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Church, what did I say? We are invincible. God, through Christ Jesus, has promised that the gates of hell, the authority of Satan, will not prevail against our church. 
We need to remember that always. Don't let him scare you. The devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, consume. I like that. In other words, he has a lot of noise he makes, but he has no teeth unless God says so. We were taught that in the story of Job. Foundational truth. A foundation is, first of all, a load-bearing part. When you built this building, the very first thing you had to do was put down a foundation. In Michigan, they require foundations on a one-story building to at least be more than three foot into the ground because of the frost line. And if it goes taller, then you have to have your foundation even deeper. So it's load-bearing. It's the underlying basis or principle, and finally, the action of establishment. Action of establishment. All things stand firmly on the power of the foundation in buildings, in life, and especially in the church. This evening, we're going to take a look at these foundational truths through a threefold interpretation of the rock. The identification of the rock, or the identification of the foundation, the significance of the foundation, and the ongoing work upon that foundation. You know, the word rock, when you stop and think about it, was used a lot in the Old and New Testament. It was by the rock that God told Moses to provide the life-giving water to the children of Israel in their exodus to the Promised Land. It was by a rock that God delivered little David, the shepherd boy, from the giant of the heathen nation, the Philistines, it's by the rock, Jesus Christ, that we are delivered from hell and damnation. The rock. The Old Testament points to Christ. The, Old, the New Testament's all about Christ. And tonight we're going to take a look at those three foundational truths. But first let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for its truth. Lord, I pray you'll guide and guard the words that I speak and that you'll touch the hearts and the, and the ears of the listeners tonight, Lord, that we might hear from you. Lord, we love you. We want to be pleasing to you. We're careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Matthew 16, in verse 13. Most of my preaching career, I've preached behind the cross. First time I ever preached behind three crosses. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> the identification of the foundation. In Matthew 16, in verses 13 to 15, we read here, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's a very important question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? You know, many times even Christians don't understand the significance of Jesus in their life. And his disciples, as they were listening to him, they answered and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Who is our foundation in life? If we were to go to heaven and God said, what have you to do with me in heaven? What gives you a right to be here? What is the answer that we would give him? Any other answer than the relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, would be wrong. Who is Jesus? We find the power with identification. In verses 16 and 19, or 16 through 19, and Simon Peter answered and said on, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but the Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, pebble. He was not the first pope. <laughs> he was not the rock. He was just some of the building material in the church. 
And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever there uh, thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosened. Do you realize that that is an eternal security verse, even though we don't use it that way most of the time? You have to have that relationship with Christ before you go into eternity. Then it's too late. Can I say this? There are no unbelievers in hell. But it's too late to believe then. The rich man said to Abraham, he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus. You see, he realized, he believed then, but it was too late. He was in hell. We find then that there is a power with the identification. The church has greater authority than any other establishment on the earth today. How dare anyone stand against it? That's why your pastor and I have been so adamantly involved in, in the affairs of the state. Some people say, well, preachers, you shouldn't get involved in that. Can I say that down through the history of our nation, preachers have always led the battle? The black robe regiment were all preachers. The promise in identification, the psalmist said it well this way in Psalm 62, 7, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. So he is our glory or confidence. He is our refuge. He is our strength. Psalm 95, 1 says this, O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Identifying the foundation. Does everyone here tonight, and I'm not asking for showing hands right now, does everyone here tonight realize that our foundation is in Christ Jesus? The state cannot take that away from you. The devil cannot take that away from you. You can't even take that away from you. Jesus said that all that hath come to me, the Father has given me, and, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He is our foundation, identifying our foundation. Secondly, the significance of the foundation, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 20, the right foundation is essential. In verses 13 through 20, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, I was in the Holy Land and, and visited the very place where he gave this message. It was not a huge mountain like you would think. It was a rolling hillside, but it was strategically placed where people sitting below him could hear all of his words. He says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there will be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This plural of salvation is wrong. It is heresy. It is straight from hell. One way, in a very narrow way, <clears throat> one door into heaven. It has always amazed me that Judas Iscariot literally in the Garden of Gethsemane kissed the door of heaven and went to hell. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. I had a person one day said, well, I don't know if I'll make it to heaven, but I at least hope I'll make it in the suburbs. I said, no, you either in or out. It's a narrow gate, it's a straight gate. In verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Do you realize that not only in the black community, but around the world today, that probably 90% of churches, I'm not talking about a particular denomination, I'm talking about all churches, 
churches that identify themselves as a church are teaching a salvation by works. And again, we've already said that works are not going to get you into heaven. <clears throat> you say, how can you say that, preacher? Well, hang on, I'll show you in just a second. Ye shall know them by their fruits do men gather grapes of thorns and figs of thistles. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. I principled a Christian school for a few years, and, and I'd, I'd get a kick out of parents. They'd come in and say, well, you just don't understand little Susie or Johnny. They really are good on the inside. Only God knows their heart. You're judging them on their outside. I said, you're right. Only God knows their heart. I said, but by their fruit, ye shall know them. They didn't like it, but, you know, that's why we had in-school suspension and things like that for the ones that had bad fruit. In verses 21 to 23, the right specification is critical. Jesus saying this. Now listen to what Jesus says. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Class, what is the will of the Father for us? To receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Amen? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That's personal works. And in thy name have cast out devils. That's works. And in thy name done many wonderful works. That's works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. A works-based salvation is nothing more than iniquity. It's sin. It's a transgression against God's will. And then we find here the right stabilization is crucial. In verses 24 to 27, we see here he says, Therefore, whosoever heareth those sayings of mine, or these sayings of mine, and doeth them, remember James said this, not only to be hearers, but to be doers of the word of God. I liken him unto a wise man. In Proverbs, the whole book really is teaching us that to leave God out of the equation is a fool. I believe that even Christians can make foolish decisions when they leave God out of the decision, out of the equation. Every once in a while I have people who come to me and say, Pastor, I prayed about it and the Lord told me to do this. I knew very well that was not what God told him to do because it was contrary to his own word. And God will never tell us to do anything that is contrary to his word. Can I have an amen? I had a young lady and, and a young fellow come to me one time, and they said, we can't afford to get married. I said, yes, you can. I said, I won't charge you a thing. You can use the church for free, and we'll even get a potluck together for the meal. And they said, well, we want to wait and have big ones, so we're just going to live together. And God said that was all right. I said, God did not say that was all right. That is a foolish decision. He said, if we listen to him and we do him, he considers us a wise man which builds his house upon what? A rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell and it, and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. In other words, the storms of life will come. How many here have never faced a storm in their life? That's what I thought. Doesn't mean we won't have storms. Sometimes people get the wrong impression. Well, I'm saved now. I've got a perfect, joyful life ahead of me. Wrong. Devil's going to step up his attack. But we can have peace in those storms. 
And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Can I spell that out for you? The state, that's S. A bank account, that's A. Uh, nothing to do with the church or determination. A fellow by the name of Earl Nightingale one time, he said, whatever a man's mind can think about, he can achieve. And there's some truth in that, but we need to be careful what we're thinking about. Paul said we need to stop that stinking thinking. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Why? No foundation. No foundation. The foundation was in things that shift, things that are shifty. And then we see the ongoing work upon the foundation. Turn to 1 Corinthians quickly with me. I will try to get done as quick as I can here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul here writing to the church of Corinth, house of Chloe actually, was the first recorded of, there was actually four letters that Paul had sent to the church of uh, Corinth. Two of them are recorded in the word of God. First one was really, if you stop and think about it, he was answering questions that were sent to him from the house of Chloe. And you can kind of tell that by the answers he gives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and beginning with verses 6 and 11, he was talking about some dispute that was going on in the church. And he really kind of put the, per, the perspective where it belonged, the priority where it was. He says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Your pastor was talking about the history of the church and the pastors over the years, and, and God has brought tremendous men here down through the years of, the, of this church. And he used those men in mighty ways, and he used the church in mighty ways. But every bit of the increase was from above, amen? So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. We work together as a team, but God is watching us individually. For we lay our labors together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Now he's talking more of a personal sense how we're building our life upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. How are we building our life as Christians? Foundation has already been laid, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The building material must be inspected. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. You know, it's quite interesting when you were building this building, and I think you got into the building, what, in June, July, something like that? Right, Pastor? And, uh, and there's still some things that need to be done, and, and uh, you'll have it done shortly. But there's a lot of work that goes into building. Boy, I've been in, in every three, all three of the churches that I pastor, we had building projects, and, and uh, you had to check everything. You had to make sure everything was right. And, and even when I build something personally, and you go down the lumber yard, and you, you take those two by fours, and you check down that two by four, and make sure that it's for a wall, and not for the bow of a boat. <laughs> had a guy got mad at me one time. I threw, kept throwing two by fours aside. He says, you're rejecting more than you're taking. I said, well, send those to Bay City. They build boats over there. <laughs> now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, six elements, six things. 
gold and silver, refiner's fire is a pot where they put the gold and silver in, they boil it, and the dross or the imperfections float to the top and they scrape that off, and what you have is a more pure gold or silver. Precious stones, heat actually turns whatever the beginning substance was. For an example, in the case of a diamond, ladies, you are uh, to really be happy that your husband gave you a finished product and not the beginning product. Nobody would wear a chunk of coal around on their finger. Get your dress all dirty. So the heat actually makes it more pure. How many were in the scouts at one time or another? Everybody knows that wood, hay, and stubble is a great way to start a fire. It's consumable, combustible products. And so literally our works are defined as either the gold, silver, precious stone, or the wood, hay, and stubble. And they're thrown into the refiner's fire to see what our reward is going to be. Not for salvation, we're already saved but for our rewards as being part of the Bride of Christ in heaven. And so all of our works go into the fire. Now, we're saved, and it talks about that. It doesn't take our salvation away. We're saved. But what is left is what we're rewarded for, and I really believe that as we stand before the beam of judgment seat of Christ, and he will have the only marred body in heaven, We'll see the nail prints in his hand. We'll see the nail prints in his feet. And he has the ability to control time. You you understand that. He sees past, present, future as the moment. And so it won't make any difference how long it takes because it's just time. And we'll stand there, and it'll all happen before the seven years is up too. (laughs) And we'll stand before him, and we'll see those nail prints, and he'll say, I loved you this much. And when we say how much we loved him, it'll be based upon what's left after the refiner's fire. I believe that tears that are wiped away later on in Revelation, some of them come from that beam of judgment seat of Christ. We could have done more. We could have meant more. We could have committed more. Building material in the foundation. The final thing is this, the inspector has the final say. Before you could have your first service in here, Pastor Berlin had to, at one time, submit to the decision of the state. (laughs) When that fellow came in and handed you what's called an occupancy permit, he had the final say so. When we get to heaven, and how we built our life upon the foundation of Christ, the inspector will have the final say. In verses 16 and 17, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? For sake of time, I just want to focus on that one verse. Do you realize that the rapture is going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Do you know how long the twinkling of an eye is? General Electric did a study on that. Can you imagine? General Electric did a study. They said it's one one one-hundredth of a second. One one one-hundredth of a second. So that means that when the rapture happens, in the midst of whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, whatever you're listening to, whatever you're seeing, whatever you're speaking, Before you're finished, you will appear before King Jesus. Will we be embarrassed? Or will we be just happy to see Jesus? Think about that the next time you think about doing something. All the time I've had people tell me, well, you know, I'm not worried about that. God and I have a deal. Yeah, same deal he has with me and everybody else. Do right, do right. Do right. The rock, the the truism of foundations in our life. Who is your foundation? And how are you building upon that foundation? 
God is watching everyone. We can't hide anything from him. He sees what we do. Is your life where it is supposed to be? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Pastor. A couple of questions for us to consider. One of them is, on whose foundation are we building? And what kind of product are we presenting? An opportunity for us to reflect. There is such joy and peace that comes from knowing Christ as our Savior. And there is greater joy and peace of being prepared to stand before him and give an account. Living in obedience and submission to his program, to his word, to his person, and reflecting him. It's an opportunity for us to be honest. I oftentimes encourage us before I preach and ask the Lord to help us to be as honest right now as what we'll have to be on Judgment Day. That's how we grow in grace. And so if the Lord has touched on something, I would encourage you, do business with the Lord. I'm going to ask you to just stand. Sharon's going to play a song of invitation. It's an opportunity for you to do business with the Lord. I'm going to ask my deacons if they would make their way to the front here. We're not going to sing. It's just a chance for us to talk to the Lord. Don't let this be a time to stretch, to try to end the service. But may it be a time where we do business with God, letting him accomplish what it was that he brought us here to do. be seated. The communion time of the Lord's Supper is a ordinance of the local church and it is a command of the Lord Jesus that we do this as oft as we will. At Faith Baptist Church we have chosen about once a month and we typically do it on the first Sunday night of the month. And it's an opportunity for us to remember the Lord's death until he come. To remember that without Christ, we were hopeless. And without Christ, we're helpless. But with him, we have great hope and great help. And so it is in Christ that we put our faith and trust, both for our salvation and our sanctification, and it is Christ in whom we uh, desire to demonstrate love. I think that is a great challenging thought that Dr. Franzel just gave to us. On Judgment Day, as we stand there and Christ has his nail-pierced hand spread out, he said, this is how much I loved you. This is how much I love you. And as the refiner's fire is proving the work that we did, we get to demonstrate, not with lip service, but with real tangible reward, how much we love him. What communion does is it helps to bring everything back into perspective. And though we're tempted to be selfish, and oftentimes embrace the sinfulness, sensuality of our culture, and that which we are bombarded with all of the time, 
It's an opportunity for us to realize that it was that sin and selfishness that sent our Savior to the cross. And it was his willingness to go to the cross that is the reason that we can go to heaven and have our sins forgiven. And so 1 Corinthians 11 says, examine yourself. This isn't a time to examine everyone else. This isn't a time that it's anybody's business as to who takes and who doesn't. This is a time for us to examine ourselves, to see, am I lackadaisical regarding selfishness and sin? Have I accommodated selfishness and sin? And am I defending selfishness and sin? Or am I willing to sacrifice all of that and surrender it to show God how much I love him? Because I'm remembering how much he loved me. We practice close communion. If you're a member of our church or a member of a church of like faith and practice, we encourage you to participate with us. It's an opportunity for us while the elements are being distributed to pause and reflect on the opportunity that, it is, that is ours to serve him. To serve him because we love him. Serve him because he is worthy to confess our shortcomings and to be right with him before we partake. We're thankful that 1 John 1, 9 teaches us that if we confess or to agree with God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, I've often said our church ought to leave as close to God as we possibly can every time we have communion. Every person should be right with God. Hating sin the way we should hate sin, confessing sin the way that we should, and embracing God in true holiness out of a heart of love and appreciation for who we are in Christ. And that can take place, and it ought to take place, and that is the purpose for why we're here. And so I'm going to ask Jim Stikes if he would pray, thanking the Lord for his broken body that is pictured for us in the bread. And then I encourage you to spend some time praying as the elements are distributed and letting God do a work of grace in our hearts. Our Father, we cannot love you enough. We can never be worthy of your love for us. We thank you for that. We thank you for your body, for your sacrifice, for your willingness to do for us what we could not do. Lord, we pause tonight to remember, to look forward to your return, and to say thank you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.
For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. I've asked Josh to pray, thanking the Lord for his shed blood pictured for us in the cup. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you sacrificed yourself coming from on high for us, sinful people. I pray, Lord, and I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to remember how vital this decision is for everyone to be reunited with you in heaven, Lord. And I pray that as we remember, we walk out of here to be a light unto the lost, unto our communities, unto our families. Help us, help us all put this as a priority in our lives to tell others about what you did on the cross. Amen. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Here at Faith Baptist Church, following communion, we like to sing, I love you, Lord. Remember, he's standing there saying, This is how much I love you. And our opportunity to not just in word, but in deed, communicate that we love him. Let's stand together. I love you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for all you've done. I don't
opportunity for us to give in our deacon caring or benevolence offering. This offering we give of our access to be a blessing to those in our church who fall on tough times, and I trust that you'll give uh, as the Lord directs you to be a blessing to bear one another's burdens. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for your gracious giving to us. And as you direct us, may we be obedient in giving to bear the burdens of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray, God, that you would bless it, give wisdom in the distribution of it, so that you alone will be glorified in it. We do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On a wonderful positive note, some of you have wondered, what are we going to do for a baptistry? Well, we have a portable baptistry that's very nice, ordered, and this Friday it is to be delivered. And so we have several that want to follow the Lord and Believer's baptism. You might know somebody or you might be here and you need to take that step. I would be uh, encouraged to hear from you that you want to make that step. We'll be having a baptismal service very soon. And uh, we have a couple of families waiting to join uh, because of that one step that is necessary. And so we're excited about that. However, we have another couple who have been associate members uh, because they would be snowbirds and go to Florida uh, in the winter time. And, um, and they came to me and they said, Pastor, we love our church and uh, we're just going to sell our place in Florida and stay north. And so uh, Paul and Sharon Crippen uh, have come and they said, Pastor, we want to join. And they've been associate members, which allows them to, to be a part in some uh, part, but still have a membership uh, at their church in Florida. And uh, they said, we just want to be full-fledged members. And so uh, I'll entertain a motion that we bring Paul and Sharon Crippen into membership. Leo Hagen makes a motion. Ron Tackle seconds it. All in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed by no? So moved. I'm going to ask Paul and Sharon, if you'll make your way up here, I'll ask my staff and their families, deacons and their families, and then all of our members to make a line and uh, welcome this dear couple into the membership of Faith Baptist Church. They have already been a blessing to us. This is a mere formality at this point, but we are rejoicing in what God is doing uh, in our church. Can I also say that don't forget, you're going to be instructed as to how to stack and move what chairs do need to be moved. Uh, Brother Gary, do we have to move all of the chairs or is there partitions back? All right. So we're only stacking those back there. And, um, and so as you get through the line, if you can help stack them up and uh, we'll tell you where, where to move them to. Uh, but we are rejoicing. Let's all stand together. We'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for what you are doing at Faith Baptist Church. We love Paul and Sharon, and we are so grateful that you have brought them to us, gifted for this body, 
and we pray that you would unite our hearts in Christian love. I pray that we would grow in our love for each other. Our, grow, our, our love for you would grow and mature. And as we link our arms in service together, may we bear one another's burdens and may we encourage one another and strengthen one another as we serve you faithfully till you come. We thank you for Dr. Franzo. We thank you for his, his faithfulness to the work. We thank you for your calling in his life and the opportunity to be presented with Alabama, Alabama Baptist Seminary. I pray that you would uh, continue to use him as uh, this ministry grows and develops to train another generation. We ask you to dismiss us with your grace and help us to glorify you this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you dearly. You are dismissed.